Hi there, welcome back to our course on being human or human sexuality, healthy human sexuality. And we're in lecture six, our last talk, which is about basically LGBTIQ and church practice or pastoral practice, how we engage practically with LGBTIQ plus community and pastor and share life together. So because it's the last lecture, I just want to again honor Jesus' presence by saying, Lord, it's really wonderful that we can serve you, we can know you, and that you walk with us and live with us and empower us and heal us and change us. And Lord, I just again pray with this last talk, just speak to your people, everyone who listens to this talk, and just help guide and encourage them in this journey of sexual of human sexuality towards sexual wholeness and maturity in Jesus name so before I engage with this last one I just want to comment on the fact that from the last uh, lecture on the Bible and LGBTIQ this book by Robert Gagnon is probably the benchmark book of hermeneutics, how we, how we interpret scripture in regard to homosexual practice. It's called the Bible and homosexual practice. And notice he puts the emphasis on practice, Robert Gagnon, and um, how we work with the Bible. It's the most um, exhausting and clear benchmark book on, um, in that regard. And the second book that I just wanted to mention is by Dr. Jeffrey Satanova. It's called Homosexuality and the Politics of Truth. So as a psychologist um, and, a, and a, um, a Christian, he talks about the whole phenomena, especially of homosexuality, from all the different aspects theology, psychology, psychiatry, social, etc. And he talks about how truth is used politically um, as mistruths. That is a very important book to understand the phenomena of sexual orientation, sexual preference, gender, confusion, in terms of the multiple causes and factors at different stages of development that can contribute to um, sexual orientation. So, because it's a big subject, orientation, preference, gender dysphoria, how it happens, when it happens, why it happens, and how it presents, um, which he addresses up to some point. And then lastly, just to recommend from the last lecture, which I forgot to, is uh, Andy Kamiski, who himself for many years was a, a practicing homosexual, became a follower of Jesus and started Living Waters Ministry. Um, this book, Pursuing Sexual Wholeness, is a very helpful book on the sexual journey and healing towards wholeness. And then Leanne Payne's book um, called The Broken Image, Restoring Sexual Wholeness Through Healing Prayer, is another helpful resource. So, into the next lecture five areas of application when it comes to um, the church and pastoral practice. Um, I will be talking about attendance, church attendance and membership, communion, baptism, baby dedications, and then ministry and leadership, these various aspects of church life and practice. And I'll end up with some comments on the constitution and church policy. But first of all, some principles before we engage in the practice and then we'll look at church attendance and membership. So we've spoken about the three positions, non-welcoming and non-affirming position in terms of LGBTIQ from the church's point of view, and then welcoming and affirming of LGBTIQ+. In the middle, welcoming but non-affirming and this is what follows in terms of church praxis and pastoral praxis. We need to be, um, the spirit of the church's response is important as opposed to the 
rules or policies or legalism of the legal requirements of the church's response. In other words, to be genuinely welcoming in the spirit of Jesus, <laughs> which is the scandalous love of the prodigal father, because the prodigal son parable is actually about God's love is so scandalous that it's prodigal in the way he received the prodigal son and loved him or her, yet not without discrimination when it came to ethics and morality. So it's holding the tension of the kingdom ethics with the, with, on the one hand with the radical welcome of true love and acceptance on the other hand. Thirdly, we are spirit-led, operate, we work case by case, as a, guided by biblical ethics as opposed to just a blanket way of treating all people. So just know I personally, in my pastoral experience over the years, have worked with um, gay orientation in various individuals over the years, both in counseling and ministry. And it's a very real subjective reality. So one has to work with it sensitively, compassionately and carefully within the context of what's happening with that particular person and not impose blanket rules and, um, on them. But neither do we go the liberalist way of just accepting um, and endorsing and not confronting. We also obviously repent from our prejudice and judgment in, in terms of pre the previous history of, of church life, which has been unhelpful in attitude towards LGBTI people. But also equally we must define homophobia because it's been misused. So just to say two words have, have been redefined. The one is homophobia. Homophobia simply means fear of the same sex, with its men fearing men, women fearing women, for whatever reason we may fear. But it's actually been reinterpreted to mean fear of same-sex intimacy, as in uh, genital intimacy, which, which is not right, because we can be psychosocially intimate among males and among females, like David and Jonathan, were very affectionate and warm and close and loved one another as like two males that were like brothers. A friend who sticks closer than a brother. <laughs> and there was nothing erotic or genital or sexual about it as such. I know that uh, affirming hermeneutics use David and Jonathan relationship to justify um, um, you know gay relationships but they they homophobia d means that I'm scared of the same sex but it does has nothing to do with psycho emotional intimacy of the same sex while disagreeing with genital practice of the same sex so when I I say I disagree with the practice and people call me homophobic, they've misinterpreted and misused the word. The same with marriage. Marriage between a man and a man and a woman and a woman is not marriage. That word marriage has been redefined in recent years. For 6,000 years of human history, marriage meant a man and a woman in a covenant of marriage. But that word too has been redefined. So. We walk alongside and we pastor people struggling with orientation and with identity issues, but we draw a line when it comes to same-sex practices. And all sexual sin is treated the same way across the board. In other words, both heterosexual sin in all its various forms, premarital sex, living together, as well as homosexual practice or lesbian practice. We cannot be selective in our sexual ethics. Um, and also, again, to, to acknowledge that as a church, we've lost the ground of uh, abstinence until marriage, where premarital sex is the norm these days. And even living together, heterosexually, uh, almost is becoming the norm without commitment to marriage, which has to be confronted and addressed. And then 
The conclusion simply is that we have to change our old approach uh, in church life, which used to be that you first must behave and then you believe and then you can join the church and belong. And it's been turned around to say, you come to church, you, you journey towards God and come to know God and belong in community. And then you, then you come to believe and commit to follow Jesus. And then your behavior starts changing because your beliefs then have changed. And that journey of first coming to belong, then discovering faith and believing, and then changing behavior uh, basically is more messy than the other way around of you first got to change your behavior and believe right and then you can belong here, which was the old unfortunate non-welcoming and non-affirming dismissive or the way of, of, of rejection. And we, and we rather live with mess and have a, a missional redemptive approach than, leaving with than living with clinical tidiness and legalism that requires people to jump through hoops before we accept them. So those are some of the guiding principles and now the, and now the practice, the practical side. So when it comes to church attendance and membership, and let me have a sip of tea, um, we talk about attendance at public meetings of the church that obviously is open to everyone. So Muslims, Hindus, anyone, <laughs> LGBTIQ people, anyone are welcome at any of the services of any church or to be to come and gather and worship God and receive teaching from his word and see what the Lord does. But any closed meetings that are closed for church members, obviously that's different. So one then talks about a membership process, which, which um, leads into our next point. But let me emphasize the gospel mandate of Jesus is the radical openness and welcome to anyone to come and, and attend our meetings and worship with us. The movement in terms of membership, the movement from, from contact with people to people beginning to attend our meetings, to them becoming regular in worship, to getting to know the person and entering into some kind of relational building with the person, that then leads to dialogue and disclosure. That dynamic process that I've just outlined is where membership fits in. For some churches, they have no real formal membership process. For other churches, they have um, a, a, a formal membership process. So I, as a pastor of Valley Vineyard and Vineyard churches over the years, always practiced what we call exploring membership class, where new people attending would come and join a class for, for four sessions or sometimes six sessions before they considered formally committing to be part of this family. If they felt God had joined them and we felt God had joined them. And in the membership process, exploring membership classes, we would begin to raise some of the questions. But it's a journey from attendance to regular worship to getting to know people to entering into a relationship, inviting them into commitment to belong and be part of the church so that they can be held accountable and we can serve them with clearing expectations of what membership means. And, but for most churches, the policies of membership in practice actually collapse into the policies around the communion table, who can actually take communion, and also around baptism, believers' baptism who can actually um, be baptized. But in terms of LGBTIQ+, obviously worship, public meetings, becoming part of the church, engaging in relationship building, attending home groups, um, coming into membership, is all part of it and should be open. At some point in the relational building, questions start arising that then enter into deeper dialogue, which I will come to. Last point on this, in terms of attendance and membership, is involvement in home groups. These are these smaller communities within homes are also obviously open to all except 
that if one would draw a line either if a person within a home group becomes argumentative and starts pushing gay ideology or transsexual ideology or the LGBTI agenda within the home group and start would begin to cause tension and division. Or on the other hand, if people within the home group discriminate against and don't like the, this gay person being present in the home group and joining with us as a group and then starts discriminating against them. Both parties, we would bring correction and, sp and the home group leader would speak to the people concerned outside of the home group first to adjust them, correct them for the sake of healthy journeying together as a home group or asking them to leave the home group and not come if they are bent on causing division either way. So that's just our first comment about attendance and membership. That brings us to the end of uh, our first segment. Thank you. Okay, we're in our second segment of Lecture 6. It's actually our last segment. This is a shorter lecture compared to all the others. And uh, having spoken about attendance and membership, let's talk about communion. So in terms of communion, we focus more on the function of communion and not necessarily on the debates about the substance of the elements. And it really has to do with more having an open table or versus a closed table. So again, if you're listening and you're from a Catholic or Anglican or mainline historical church background, you will know generally it's more of a closed table with high church liturgical practice of communion but in generally in evangelical and charismatic churches in vineyard and with freedom house church we have an open table where we have communion on a sunday morning with everyone there and we don't discriminate against who sits here who must not eat of the bread and the wine or who can eat so it's not really about um, you know the moral worthiness per se of who can eat of the bread and, and drink of the wine because Jesus himself had meals with sinners. In fact, he developed a reputation, quite a controversial one, of, of, of having meals with drunkards and sinners and prostitutes, tax collectors, etc. I mean, even at the Last Supper before he was crucified, he ate with Judas Iscariot and he washed his feet who would betray him. So that's an open table of communion where whoever's present can come and participate and eat and drink. But the only comments about exclusion per se is by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So when Paul says, when we eat of the body of the Lord and drink of his blood, we must discern the body of Christ so that we're not eating and drinking God's discipline upon ourselves. And basically what he is saying is we must just be aware of the people around us that the communion is given to share and to serve and to empower and help and heal others rather than just God and me and taking everything for myself. Because the context in Corinthians and the early church was that communion was in a love feast context where in fact they used to invite people from the streets and people would eat and drink, and then at some point they would remember Christ's presence with them, but some drank more of the wine, some ate more of the cheese, and left others hungry. And Paul says in Corinthians that you guys don't consider and discern the body of Christ around you when you take the bread as the body of Christ. And you don't serve and care for others and give to others first before you eat. But you just eat and drink yourself. So don't be selfish and bring God's judgment upon you. That's the only point, actually, where Paul talks about a warning around the table of the Lord. And he says that um, some eat and drink so selfishly with attitude of disregard for the people around them that they bring themselves under God's discipline. So there's no moral fitness per se required um, to eat and to drink, except awareness of your own need for God, 
of your own brokenness where you ask God to help you. If you have any sin, you ask God to forgive you that you're conscious of. And we all need God's grace, obviously. So the last exception. So what I'm saying is that the LGBTI community and whoever else that comes into our midst all eat and drink of the Lord's table as we all do. But the one exception would be is if a person is under church discipline for whatever reason, because of unrepented sin or whatever, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, then, then they would not be allowed to eat and to drink until their formal church discipline process is resolved. And that's another subject. Secondly, baptism. And a, a, baptism is seen as, as an a, initiatory rite in, into Christian faith. It's part of Christian in, initiation. And in the New Testament, it happened always soon after conversion. When people expressed faith in Jesus and gave their lives to Christ, then they were baptized. But in our time, it follows often way after salvation or after a lengthy process of, cate of catechism. But there is evidence, even in the New Testament, that there was some at least minimal preparation for baptism. And often today, we do prepare people for water baptism when they become followers of Jesus. And there's a very helpful book by Robert, by Robert Munger called My Heart, Christ's Home, which speaks about Jesus coming into our lives, as it were, into our, the lounge, and then into the dining room, sharing more then into the kitchen and eventually into the bedroom, the most private inner pot. And so the process of pre preparation for baptism is a dialogue to help people understand what baptism means. And in that process, what might arise in, the, in your bedroom, in, in the inner heart, is that you're involved in a lifestyle and belief practice that is dishonoring to God or that goes against scripture that maybe needs to be addressed before you are baptized. We don't make, again, complete moral purity and moral righteousness a requirement in order to be baptized because many people are baptized soon after salvation in the early church. But the minimum preparation that we do do would then begin to uncover um, an aspect of a person's life or morality whereby they may have to make a choice. I'm a, I'm a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. I'm being baptized as an, as an act of obedience and commitment to follow Jesus. But this area of my life that we've now spoken about, I don't want to change. And if they put up a no trespassing sign is that I am gay and I'm practicing my gay orientation and I'm not going to change that even if you say the Bible um, says differently, then we would withhold baptism. Then it would become difficult. So I have personally as a pastor had the experience of um, Christians, really wonderful Christian people who've been through divorce, who become skeptical, skeptical about marriage and end up living together and actually don't want to marry formally because of the fear of that commitment of marriage and so and come to church and actually join a home group and then at some point wanted to be baptized in water and when i raised this issue of them living together why not get married and honor the scriptures and honor the covenant of marriage and conscience and god's creation design and community and get married they refused to and hence, I refuse to baptize them because baptism at the, um, at the end of the day is our public act of obedience, committing that I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus now. And if we uncover an area in a person's life and they put up a no trespass sign, I'm not changing, I don't want to go there, then I say, okay, until we can talk more and you're ready, um, let's withhold baptism so that we have integrity when we do do the baptism. So that would be my understanding of baptism. Baby dedication. There is slim evidence in the Bible for baby dedication. It is actually what we can call a church rite. It's not a 
Christian ordinance. It's not a biblical ordinance or an ordinance of Christ per se. And really, baby dedication came about in evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal churches as a kind of replacement for the mainline churches and reformed churches, Catholics, of baby baptism or baby christening. Um, christening and baby baptism has a different theology behind it. So when we talk of baby dedication, we use the model of Jesus where he received the children and he just blessed them. And so any baby, any parents or person that's asking us to bless this baby, generally I would, I would say, yes, I will bless the baby. And I will use any baby dedication, either within the church or even outside the church, as an opportunity for evangelism. So I have been asked by people outside the church to bless a baby. But then it comes to the question of a gay couple or a lesbian couple that have adopted a child or had a child born through a surrogate, a surrogate mother. Um, or in, um, however, and ask to do a baby, to, to dedicate that baby. That then becomes sensitive and difficult because I there draw the line between the public uh, dedication of a baby of a same-sex couple, which then in body language basically endorses the marriage of the same-sex couple or the common law marriage or partnership, as opposed to just blessing that baby and asking God to protect the baby and doing it privately, perhaps in their home. So the baby itself is innocent and has no choice. And there's nothing wrong in and of itself just to bless a baby or a child in Jesus' name and ask God to protect them and pray that they grow up to get to know the Lord, which is what we do do when we do baby dedication. But um, would not do it publicly, uh, through th thereby our body language endorsing same-sex partnerships. And then um, ministry and leadership. Um, participation in ministry is open to people who are working with their um, gender identity, their sexual preference, their orientation, their dysphoria, whatever that is, but are not practicing it. When it comes to practicing what we believe our orientation is, that then crosses a line. So we have people that can engage in ministry in different kinds in the church, especially behind the scenes ministry, um, where they serve and they, and they have their gay orientation and they maybe even self-identify as gay or lesbian or even transsexual, but are not acting out on it and are not imposing it on others and are not um, um, imparting the ideology and are not giving the, the, the biblical justifications to legitimize what they've chosen to believe about themselves. Though that area is open for people to engage in ministry of all kinds. We would then draw the line at the beginnings of leadership. So ministry always leads at some point to leadership where people begin to exercise leadership over others, whether it's a small team or a growing team or, or, or a new ministry. Because leadership has to do with, with public trust and with modeling. And the requirements for leadership, especially that Paul gives in 1 Timothy chapter 3, among them are the moral qualifications as well as other qualifications that um, basically either enhance the integrity of leadership as holding public trust of the people or undermine it by modeling something different and raising questions of integrity and discipleship and even even morality so anyone who is in any way struggling with their orientation 
and on the edge of practicing and are vulnerable to temptation, we would not um, allow to, to move into leadership levels. If a person is practicing their orientation, then we would not allow them into leadership. We would want to work with them and talk with them and journey with them. Um, obviously, no sex in whatever form outside of, of heterosexual marriage or the biblical model of, of marriage between a male and a female is permitted, whether it's heterosexuals, homosexuals or transsexuals. Um, if that does happen, then it becomes a matter of church discipline. If, if any leader is, is uh, found out to be practicing sex outside of marriage as God's design. So we do not permit, at least within the vineyard, and I'm a vineyard, I'm an ordained vineyard pastor, we do not permit a pastor or a lay leader or any, any member of the church in an official capacity to perform or to bless or to officiate at a same-sex marriage or a civil union. And as I said before, uh, same-sex same -sex marriage is not really a marriage according to the history of the meaning of that word. It, it should really be better called a civil union or a partnership a, a agreement. But if a pastor or leader or a church member officiates <laughs> at any such civil union or marriage, it would really be an endorsement of breaking creation design and the effacing of God's image as God intended it in the book of Genesis. So we would not allow that. So that covers then the issue of ministry and leadership. So you've I'm going to close up with just two comments on church constitution and statement of faith. But just to summarize and say these issues of attendance, membership, communion, baptism, ministry, leadership, generally are all relationally determined and are dynamic as to who is the person concerned, where are they at in their journey, what is the effect they're having on the people around them, how contained are they in, their, in the integrity of abstinence and self-containment, or are they acting out, are they promoting, etc., etc. And decisions are made relationally as we go along in the journey. So I always illustrate it like this. I say, if you build a bridge of relationship that is 20 kilograms strong, <laughs> then you can only carry across 10 kilograms of truth. If you try to carry across 30 kilograms of truth, the relationship, the bridge will break. So the extent to which we, were, we come to know people, love people, journey with people, understand their story, hear their struggle in life and their pain, and work with them, and build up relational goodwill and equity. To that extent, we can ask the uncomfortable questions, the hard questions, challenge them, guide them, teach them in terms of the biblical way, um, so that they can. there's a higher chance of them being, being able to receive it and be transformed by it, as opposed to just blundering in, laying down rules, quoting the Bible, and just breaking any equity there is and losing people along the way. So it's the way of, it's a much more messy way of being, of being missional and redemptive as opposed to the tidy clinical way of keeping the church pure and clean. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So lastly, in terms of constitution, so I always recommend for all churches to write into their constitution some clauses that protect themselves against legal challenges that are coming um, with the change of legislation, especially in regard to um, same-sex marriage and the hate speech bill and saying we disagree with gay practice. Some LGBTIQ plus people may find it dis discriminatory and be offended by it and then lay a charge at a police station against me after maybe even hearing these talks. 
So we need to also do what we can do to legally protect ourselves. So at our church following Jesus, we own a property called Vineyard Community Center. And um, it, the, the, um, the property was hired out for different functions. And uh, we wrote into the constitution as the elders or the oversight team that we reserve the right of entry and of usage with the process of renting out the facilities. And uh, we worded that with the help of a lawyer. And then in that clause in the Constitution, we referred to our statement of faith. Because religious organizations who own facilities that are hired out to the community can cover themselves in their statement of faith by their religious convictions. So in clause 15 of our statement of faith, we stated clearly the belief and definition of marriage and that that definition prohibits the higher the rental of our facility to be used for same sex gay marriages. Um, and the clause goes like this. We believe marriage is a holy institution and ordained by God exclusively between a naturally born man and a naturally born woman as per God's created design in Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 27 and 28 and Genesis 2, 23 and 24. Marriage or married, in quotation marks, is the biblical word for a permanent binding covenant entered into before God and community and civil society between one natural man and one natural woman. This is the context in which sexual intimacy for the purpose of mutual love and procreation of children is to be expressed. This is the concept Paul uses in the New Testament with regard to qualification for leadership, instructing that a leader, if not single, should be the husband of one wife. In other words, both to be sexually faithful in the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. This excludes all other forms of sexual relationship, whether temporary or permanent. Such sexual behavior or relationship disqualifies its, its participants from any leadership role in the church. So that was clause 15 in our vineyard statement of faith that then we referred to in our local church constitution that would help cover us and empower us so that we w did not have to lease the facilities to um, organizations um, that would practice things that would violate our religious conscience and biblical understanding. So that has brought us to the end of this lecture six. And that has brought us to the end of this course. And I just want to close with prayer and say, I bless you in the name of our Lord Jesus. And I bless you with the grace and the goodness and the love of God. May God touch you. May God heal you. May God grow you. And may you become a sexually whole person that images God and brings the presence of God through sexual wholeness and maturity for the good of all those around you. In the name of Jesus, I bless you. Thank you for listening and joining with me in this course. God bless.